people can even do this now if they do have even small amounts of revenue coming into their business even taking half a percent even 0.1 of a percent and just getting that habit of actually have getting to a place where you have a buffer episode 89 hello and welcome to the business of architecture uk i'm your host ryan willard and this week once again i'm flexing the zoom account and connecting with people right across the country from the confines of my home office and this week i'm speaking with annette ferguson who is a chartered accountant. She's otherwise known as the money magician. She's got a lot of experience working with service-based entrepreneurs, helping them find clarity in their numbers, increasing and growing their wealth, and ultimately being able to take more money home from their businesses. Previously, she worked as a financial controller for Goldman Sachs. And if you go onto her website, she has got the most incredible set of resources and content and podcast talking about financial controls in your business, the best ways to grow and maintain your wealth, and of course, how some of the government um, loan schemes are impacting or can be used by businesses right now, which is what we're going to talk about today in this episode, because a lot of people have been emailing me and asking me questions about furloughing. So I've put a lot of these questions to Annette. And in this episode, we discuss furloughing, micro loans, the bounce back loans, and the coronavirus business interruption loan schemes. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Annette Ferguson. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Annette, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. An absolute pleasure to be connecting with you here via Zoom. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Where are you based? You're up in in Scotland, is that right? I I am, yeah. I am about 20 miles south of Edinburgh, although my team are located all across the country. Fantastic. And you're a chartered accountant. I've I've seen that you go by the moniker of the money magician. Um, And and I think it would be wise, you know, you're an entrepreneur as well who helps other entrepreneurs with their finance, with their, with their sort of financial controls, um, understanding how the money is working in their businesses, how they can invest it. And in this episode, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what we're dealing with at the moment with the coronavirus, things like furloughing, the micro loans, um, and the other government initiatives that are there to support small businesses. Um, Because I'm getting a lot of questions from architects, architectural practices at the moment about ways to move forward. What what do the intricacies of furloughing mean? So we can talk about that. Um, And I'd also like to talk to you about some of your own entrepreneurial endeavors, because uh, I think you're one of the first accountants mm-hmm. that I've come across who's like really got an incredible array of really valuable, engaging content, which is very accessible. It's easy to jump into. You know, I I came across you first on TikTok, which I'm recommending to all architects to jump on. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about, about that, because I understand previously you worked for Goldman Sachs. I did, yes. Um, and thank you for saying about my content by the way yeah 
I um I trained with a small chartered accountant firm in Edinburgh, um, dealing with a relatively similar client base to the one I do now, small owner managed businesses, um, small entrepreneurs. And by by that I mean kind of up to six to seven million turnover. Right. Um and after that, I moved to London. I, I met a boy who is now my husband. I moved to London and I um, worked in Goldman Sachs for a couple of years. I also worked in oil and gas for a while in London as well. Um, and was never really 100% happy with working for somebody else. I'd always wanted to have my own business and I just had no idea what I wanted that to be. Mm. It turned out I kind of liked the accounting thing. So I decided, actually, why don't I marry these two things together and start an accounting firm? So I did that um, about 11 years ago now. Fantastic. And it's quite a, a new, is it, is it unusual for accountants to kind of go off on their own? Because normally they're often either working in house or. Yeah, it depends. I mean, uh, the, you know, starting, starting any business is a challenge and starting an accounting firm is no different. Mm. So um, I think the most unusual thing is probably coming straight in without taking any clients with you, as it were. Right. When I started my business, I was working in oil and gas at the time. And so I didn't have, um, you know, a group of clients I was working on that I could kind of poached for want of a better word into my practice I was starting literally with zero clients and so I think that is more unusual and um and more challenging of course because you start day one with zero revenue yeah and you have to work out um how on earth am I going to manage to sustain this business which is a big reason why content and social media and everything that you've kind of alluded to that i put out there that's a big reason why I do that is because I started my business around about the time where Facebook was kind of coming in Twitter was coming in at that point and actually to me it made a lot of sense to be doing networking online as well mm -hmm. as offline I was doing face-to-face -face at that point in time I actually don't do any face-to-face -face networking now but I was at that point in time and it just for me was a marry of okay well why wouldn't I do some stuff online anyway which then of course led to me producing content and um and doing it at scale as I do now how, how did you what was the first sort of things that you were making content about how did you what got you into using Facebook or those platforms yeah so at the very at the very beginning um, it was pretty boring content in all honesty um, I was just trying to find my way and find what you know what worked so I was predominantly at that point doing written content, so blog posts for my website. Um, it was mainly around the sort of statutory requirements, you know, what is a set of annual accounts mm. and that type of stuff. Um, and it was all, it was pr predominantly written. I did foray into um, video in the early days, um, but I was not a fan of doing it at all. I just felt really self-conscious and strange about doing it. Of course, I have since got over that, definitely. But at the very beginning, I felt incredibly awkward about it. Mm. And I just felt very odd speaking into a camera because it's nothing I'd had experience of. Yes, I'd done presentations and things to a live audience, but you know, holding up a camera and speaking into it feels a little bit different when you don't have any faces to look at. Yeah. So for me, that was you know, that was a little bit of a story into that to start with, but I kind of dropped that. I also I also started a podcast um, probably about eight years ago, but I didn't keep it up. I wish now that I had done. I did it for about six or eight months, and then I just kind of gave it up with too many other things on my plate that I was spinning. Mm. So um, if only I'd kept it up now, it would have been great. But of course, I haven't. I have a podcast now anyway. But if it continued, that would have been amazing. <laughs> that, well, that's that's interesting as well, actually, because you know we uh, something like the commitment that it takes to be consistently putting out content is often the thing that differentiates who you know how successful you are, or how it works in terms of building that kind of you know that that ecosystem of of uh, micro content and long form content that people can can delve into. Yeah. What what's kept you consistent? And what was the obstacles that you were saying, like, you know, with the, with the podcast dropped out, but then you realized yeah. you brought back into it. Yeah. And it's, 
you know, consistency, consistency is incredibly difficult. And I think, um, you know, I, I tried to do a lot of things at the same time, but I didn't actually force myself to have a schedule around mm. it. So once I actually put time in my diary to record the podcast, to go live, all those kinds of things, that helped a lot. And I, you know, I made those meetings with myself in the same way I would have made a meeting with a client. So if, a client, if I had in my diary, I record the podcast at 1, a, 1, 1 p.m. on a Tuesday, and a client said to me, are you available for a call on 1 p.m. on a Tuesday? Well, the answer would be no. I already have something in my diary then. And making sure that I did actually stick to that because it's very easy when a client comes along to go, oh, I'll just put them in there and I'll figure out the content production later. But actually making sure that you are consistent with your content because that is fundamentally what drives people towards your business. But the thing is as well, I, I believe that when you're consistent with your content, it helps show your prospects and your clients that you're trustworthy because mm -hmm. if you say that you're going to produce certain content at certain times and then it doesn't come then that's not great from just a trust and image perspective to the end client as well because you're basically saying well, I said I'd do this thing but I didn't and that's not the message you want to put out either the thing that I had to realize too was that consistency and relentlessness are different things. So when I was thinking about producing content, at the beginning I was thinking I need to get something out every day and it needs to be this big piece of content and it needs to be amazing. Yes, your content needs to be good and valuable. I'm not saying it doesn't, but you don't need to produce a one hour video every single day. If it's once a week, that's okay. Just let your audience know it's once a week so they know when to expect it and you release it on the same day. And that is consistency in itself. Mm. So understanding that as well helped a lot. Amazing. And how, how, has, how many years would you say you've been producing content for? Um, well, I have, I mean, in some way or another, I've been producing content for about 10 years in reality. Mm. Um, you know, there have been periods where I've been in higher production than in others. Um, at the moment, I'm producing a lot of content. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on around, in particular, UK business, coronavirus, support available, you know, the economy at the moment, all those kinds of things. So just now I'm in, I'm doing daily live streams. I'm doing um, daily podcasts. So I am, and I'm doing, you know, multiple micro videos that or repurposed from those things as well, um, writing blog posts on it, all those kinds of things. So I'm producing a huge amount of content at the moment because it's kind of the right season in my business to do that yeah. just now. It's, you know, it's something that's very important that's going on. I can tap into what people are speaking about and I can give support on at this current point in time. So for me, even though um, unlike a number of businesses for my business, we are very busy at this point in time with client things because of all, all these things. Um, I'm still trying to step up the content even more to support that as well. And of course, remember that when you're really busy in a business, you still need to produce the content to attract people in the future. It can be really easy to go, well, I'm really busy just now, I'm just gonna cut on the content production, I'm just not gonna do it. But your content is what helps keep a stream of prospects coming in at the same time. So if you cut it when you're busy, then when you're not busy, you're not gonna get busy because you've not produced the historical content. Yes. So there's a knock-on effect for all Yeah, things. and that's really interesting actually to say that the, the, the historical content is the, th you know, what you've done three months ago kind of impacts what you, what's happening today so when you when you have those breaks in content production or outbound comms then you know you'll notice it in the future you might not notice it immediately so having that kind of yeah. consistency and just that discipline of doing it every single day almost or every week like how, how are you yeah. you know it doesn't like you say sometimes I, you know when I'm working with uh, architects and we talk about content production it either becomes this huge thing that needs to be done with massive amounts of production and like it's got to be done with you know the, the fanciest cameras and it's like it doesn't need to to go all like that it just needs to be yeah. quality in terms of what's being communicated um and as, yeah. and as you say consistent and that can be like even a, a one or two minute you know or, or a number of instagram stories or something like that that's just yeah constantly ticking over or a, a thoughtful email absolutely and all of my videos every single 
one is either filmed with my iPhone or with my webcam. I don't have a fancy video at all. It's all done either with my phone or my webcam. I'm not, I'm not investing lots and lots of money in the production. Now, I, there is a bit of post editing that goes on, but again, it's very minimal. Yeah. It's nothing massive. It does not cost me a huge amount of money to produce the content that I produce. Fantastic. Love it. Love it. I, I, mm -hmm. That for me is it's just really inspiring. And I love, I love the, the Thank power you. of what, you know, producing content can do and how it can, you know, enable businesses of all sizes to connect with new audiences and that just becomes this indispensable pipeline and right now Completely. you know is such an important time to be broadcasting and communicating and checking on people okay. checking on your community making sure they're okay seeing how you can be of service um it's not i think a lot of people get confused with marketing and producing content as always meaning selling something yeah it's not it's not at all. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm a firm believer at this point in time for many, many businesses um, who are potentially unable to be generating revenue at this time. This is an incredible time to be building up the brand, building up your content, building up your communications and your relationships with your prospects, with your current clients, with your past clients, all those kinds of things. That is an incredible use of your time just now. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to blatantly sell to anybody. It's about relationship building. Yes, totally. Brilliant. So segueing into um, kind of topical matters right now, and one of the main things I wanted to talk to you yeah. about was, you know, what what do all these terms mean for businesses that we know that we're seeing written around like furloughing, the micro loans, the bounce back loans. Um, and, and I think I, I think perhaps if we just begin with a, a kind of clarification of what furloughing means what yeah. what it means for employers they can and can't do and also what it means yeah. for directors of companies if they're going to furlough themselves yeah absolutely so furlough is a really interesting term it's one that you know in the uk we really didn't know about until a couple of months ago it's a term that's actually come over from the us and it is written into us employment contracts but of course, it's not written into UK employment contracts, which makes things a little more challenging for us. Fundamentally, when somebody is furloughed, they are essentially on a leave of absence. That is basically what it is. And people get put into furlough basically instead of making them redundant at this point in time. So it's basically saying, we have no job for you at the moment. We would ideally want to give you a job at some point in the future when work comes back in, but at the moment we just have nothing for you. And that is, that is when you put someone on furlough. You say, you, write, you have to write them a letter and they have to accept. And you basically say, we're putting you on furlough. And in most cases, people are saying you will have 80% of your wages up to a cap of 2,500 pounds which is the amount that is claimable under the job retention scheme, the JRS, from the government right. for the support. Now, there's a couple of things to note here. Technically, your employee could negotiate with you how much money they receive because furlough is an amendment to their employment contract, technically. So they could say to you, actually, I want 100%. They're allowed to ask that. Right. They're allowed to ask for different changes of terms if they want, because you are essentially renegotiating part of their employment contract. Right. So te technically, they could do all that. Now, anecdotally, I've not heard many employees doing that, but it is possible and it is allowed. What is also allowed is if you want to top up their salary, you are allowed to put them on furlough and you're allowed to basically pay them what you want from the 80% upwards. So you can top up that amount to either to whatever you want. You could top it up. They could, if they, they could be on 10 grand a month and if they are, you can top it up to that much if you wish. Now, the thing with furlough is they are not allowed to do any work. They're not allowed to do any work. Right. So what they can do is they are allowed to do training, but they are only, um, they, you have to make sure that if they are doing training, 
their furlough payment is covering national minimum wage for the period of time they are training for. So you have to do a little calculation there to make sure that it would cover it for the number of hours training that you give them. But that is it. They are not allowed to do any work for you. Now what they are allowed to do incidentally is they could go and find another job and do that job if that's not against your employment contract. So you may already have a clause in your contract that says they can't work for anyone else. And if you do, that still applies. But if you don't, they could go off and work for somebody else, whether that be a competitor, potentially unlikely if you're furloughing them and a competitor would employ them, but you never know. Um, or it could be, you know, they might want to get a job in the supermarket or something like that. So they can work elsewhere. They cannot work for your business if you have furloughed them. The minimum period you can put anyone on furlough is three weeks, and then you can pull them back off furlough if you wish after a three week period, or you can have them on furlough for the entire time. You are allowed to have somebody on furlough. Furlough was back dated to the 1st of March, and it goes out now to the end of June. But the furlough start date is the date they were furloughed from. You can't backdate it to the date before they stopped work because whilst you're furloughed, you can't work. Right. So it has to be from the date that they didn't do any work anymore. Um, a lot of companies are pulling people's inter um, computer access, passwords, all those kinds of things. So it's not possible for them to work. So they have basically proof should an audit come at some right. point in time to say, look, it was not possible for them to work at this and, and, time. And if someone is found that they were working, I suppose that's a type of fraud, right? It is a fraud. Yeah, yeah. it's benefits fraud. And HMRC have said that um, if somebody is found to be working, then it is criminally prosecutable. Uh, it's a criminal offence because it's benefits fraud. So that is something to be really aware of as well. Um, there would also be clawbacks of the benefits that were paid and those kinds of things that we would expect to happen as well. So if that kind of happens, so if you have employees, you can put them on furlough, you know, fine. You can call them back off when you reopen. The trickier situation, of course, comes with directors of limited companies. Yeah. And... The question that was raised at the very beginning, can you furlough yourself? How is that possible with director's statutory duties? How does that actually work? Um, there, the, the short answer is you can furlough yourself, but the problem is under furlough, you can't do any work. Mm. What you can do, you are allowed to submit statutory filing. And you are allowed to provide information to assist in statutory filing. So, for example, if your accountant asks for copies of invoices, you could do that. However, the legislation doesn't allow for anything else, including any other legal duties outlined in the Companies Act, which is a, real, um, a really interesting situation because it leaves us open to the question of, well, if you are a director that furloughs yourself, are you then in breach of your, some of your company's act duties yeah. that exist or not? Or are you allowed to be in breach of them by, because you've furloughed yourself? Um, that becomes very, very difficult to understand then how in reality a director could actually furlough themselves, even though you technically can. Could, could you do things... Like if you're, say you're self-employed, you've got your own limited company, you furlough yourself. Yeah. Um, and then, and then say you went to, if you, you set up another limited company mm -hmm. and started working with them. And then you were ended up claiming, you were claiming some kind of money back from one limited company. One. And now you've set up a new limited company and then you find work in the new committees, the new limited company. So now you're working in that, or you were doing it on a freelance basis. So you were registered as a sole trader or something like that. Is that legal or is that? This is a solution that has been put out there. There are a few issues with it, however. It yeah. sounds great in theory. In theory, yeah. it sounds like, oh, wonderful. That sounds perfect. There are a number of issues. Mm. If you are VAT registered in your original entity, if you are VAT registered in your limited company, then you are going to fall foul of artificial separation rules if you start 
a, either a separate limited company and trade through that doing the same thing or you go as a sole trader and you trade doing the same thing that is going to be against the artificial separation rules for vat purposes if you are back registered what's that what's um, that exactly so that means so it's basically a rule that says that you can't split up bits of business and then have some that are VAT registered some that are not you can't just put stuff through other entities because that is tax avoid tax evasion rather right. it's not tax, tax evasion got it so you can't do that so that is the problem that comes in when we look at um you know doing stuff kind of on the side as it were away from the limited company now if you're not that registered there's a bigger argument to be able to do it i still feel like it's going to be frowned upon because it's against the spirit of the legislation and the question is in an audit would that be how that would be seen the difficulty thing the difficult thing we have at the moment is this hasn't been put through the courts by anyone mm. you know with a lot of our legislation in uk tax law we have legislation that's gone through the courts and we have more information than just the legislation we have the case law to fall back on to say well in this thing this was similar to your thing and they've not allowed it so it's likely that you can either with this we just don't have anything that's been put through the courts yet i'm sure we will i say yet yeah. it's very strongly yeah. there i'm sure we will but it makes it very hard to know what side of the law the fuzzy gray bits will fall um you know if you do have work that comes in then technically you're not furloughed yeah i mean that that is the sort of legal bottom line of it mm. is you're not you're not furloughed if the business has work coming in and you need to perform that work yeah yeah the difficulty also is going to be with timings though because furlough you can claim up to two weeks in advance for furlough you can claim historically and then each time you submit you can claim up to two weeks in advance but it's going to be um difficult potentially round about the period of time where we start opening up again where lockdowns are released because if you have staff who you've applied two weeks in advance for furlough or for yourself and they suddenly say okay tomorrow or next week you can open well, then you potentially can't open because you can't get your staff back in time or yourself back in time. So that's something to really be aware of as well as we start to ease out of this. Where does that sit? Right. And because you're furloughed, does that mean that you're guaranteed a job on return? No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't mean that you're guaranteed a job on return. And we have heard already that some um, bigger businesses are already starting to put out um, at risk notices for redundancies so there are different rules about making people redundant depending on the size of entity very large entities have to give people a 45 day notice um, that they have been made redundant and they have to do they have to put them on notice two weeks before so we're starting to see very large entities speak about um, redundancies now because if we track forward to the end of june this is their time scale yeah basically to have to do that the, the same time skills don't exist with smaller businesses but it's what it depends on the number of employees so if you're unsure and you feel like you might have to make redundancies go onto the hmrc website and do check the rules for your own individual business i don't know them off the top of my head so do check the whether those apply but no if you are on furlough it does not mean that you are guaranteed a job when you come back you could be made redundant straight away there is um and and many people have said that the, the, the group of people who are in furlough just now are potentially the hidden unemployed. They are potentially a group that are at high risk of not having a job when we come back because, of course, as we lift out of lockdown and everything, we just are not sure when it's going to happen with the economy. Yeah. Um, you know, the Chancellor has said that he wants it to bounce back, that he is hoping for a V-shaped recovery, but many other economists have said, actually, we should be in, we will be in for a long, deep U-shaped recession. So it becomes very hard to, for a business to forecast what will be happening after this and therefore to know what their staff requirements will be. Um, and there's potentially going to be quite a number of redundancies as a result so do you, so is it the prediction is that the rest the the real impact of the recession is yet to be yet to be felt 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am a firm believer that we're actually at the moment, unfortunately, sitting in the easiest time period right. financially. Um, I really think that it's going to start really hitting people um, in the third quarter and fourth quarters of this year. I, I feel like at the moment, there, you know, people at the moment, people, whether that's individuals, businesses, purchasing power, people still have money on the most part in their bank accounts. Um, you know, people are getting furlough money in for their employees or, or individuals themselves are receiving furlough money in. Um, there are, you know, various initiatives, there was grants given out, those kinds of things. There is still money going around. Whereas at some point that is going to start dwindling for people. And I think that's when we're really going to start feeling it. Right. Yes. Now I was, I was looking at some of the McKinsey reports about them mm -hmm. speculating of uh, a recession that was really going to kind of dip down into the, the last quarter of the, of the yeah. year. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So some of the, some of the government initiatives in terms of loans and uh, financing for businesses, mm. could you help us understand what the difference between the micro loans are, the bounce back loans are, when these, okay. when's these should be used? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to caveat by saying that if your business was not in a place financially to have afforded loan repayments prior to going into coronavirus, it is probably a very bad idea to consider them now. Right. <laughs> because a loan needs to be something that is strategic and it needs to be, you know, yes, many of them don't have payback periods for a while and I will speak about that, but they still need to be repaid at some point. And if your business wouldn't have been able to do that before this, you have to ask some serious questions as to whether it would be able to after whilst we're potentially in a recession at the same time. So that I would really caveat that when I'm speaking about the loans, but there are fundamentally two types of loans for most businesses. One is the recently announced um, bounce back loans, um, which was just announced in the last few days. And the second is the micro loans, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, or as some people call it, Sybils, which to me sounds like a small hamster, <laughs> but that is what it is being termed. Um, so first off, the, um, the one that was announced back in March is the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. That has come under immense criticism for not paying out fast enough. Um, there have been over 300,000 applications for it and about 13% have been paid out. So there's huge, huge um, criticisms. These are loans that you go directly to your bank, primarily the bank you bank with if they offer them there are other institutions that do you apply for it and it um, is covered 80 percent by the government the government are um covering that loan by 80 percent there is no director's guarantee required on that loan for loans under two hundred and fifty thousand um, pounds above that level you are required to directors guarantee on the loan the uh, loan interest rates are determined by the bank they vary but typically we're seeing them anywhere in the region from four to seven percent roughly um, on those the interest is covered for the first 12 months by the government uh, repayments are required during the first 12 months under the terms of the loan however we're seeing many banks offering six or 12 month payment holidays on that loan but it's up to the bank's discretion as to whether they do that is not something that is legally required right. with the loans um, those loans typically you're having to submit um, annual accounts cash flow statements um, you know forward-looking projections around pre you know po what the post kind of COVID situation might be for the business as well um, it's typically quite a lengthy application process and people are typically taking eight weeks roughly to get any funds if not longer on those loans which is why they've come under a lot of criticism because not that many being paid out yet yeah so those are the business um coronavirus business interruption loan scheme and that is going to be useful for you if you need to um let if you need to borrow over fifty thousand pounds 
that is where you're going to want to look. They are typically lending 25% um, of turnover for those loans as well, up to 25% uh, of turnover. Are, are, there, are there strict conditions about what you can use that money for? Is it purely for like working capital in the business or could you go and take a loan out like that and then use it for investments or property or something? <laughs> That will depend on the individual bank themselves. Yeah. At the government level, there are no restrictions on how the funds can be used. Individual banks are allowed to put those restrictions on if they wish. I haven't seen much of that happening, yeah. but they, they are able to. They are able to if they want to. Um, so that's kind of where they sit. Now, um, I mentioned if you, if you want to um, loan 50,000 or above for those loans, that's a good idea. If you want to lend below or borrow below 50,000, then what you want to be looking at are the bounce back loans. The bounce back loans were just announced. They are not live yet. They'll be live on the 2nd of March. So depending when this podcast goes out, they might, all right, they might be live um, at that point. But, and depending on when you're listening to this, the 2nd of March is the date that they are going live. March or May? Oh, May. May, May okay. not March. March is past. <laughs> of May. I've got my uh, time goes a bit crazy sometimes <laughs> during lockdown, doesn't it? Sorry, the 2nd of May. It, Monday the 2nd of May. Um, thank you for that. And the um, the amount you can lend is between two or borrow is between 2,000 and 50,000 pounds. They are designed to be paying out quickly. So we've been told between 24 and 48 hours, you would receive the funds into your bank account. Mm -hmm. It's a short one to two page application form. These ones are underwritten 100% by the government. Um, and there are no, there's no interest fees or repayments due within the first 12 month period. So this is going to be incredibly useful for a number of businesses. But like I said, remember that a loan is strategic. And if you couldn't afford to pay for it before, ask yourself whether you can afterwards as well. Um, but for a number of businesses, it's going to be incredibly helpful because it will be coming out a lot faster. That is the aim anyway. We haven't been told what interest rates will be on those loans, but we have been told they will be reasonable rates. So we can assume uh, that they may be roughly the same as the business interruption loan scheme right. rates. We've also not been told what how they, people will be assessed for how much they can borrow. So at the moment, we're going on the assumption that it may be a percentage of the turnover, possibly 25% in the same way that the coronavirus business interruption loan schemes are, probably based on previous, the last set of filed accounts, potentially allowing management accounts in as a submission, but we just don't know at the moment. So I would urge people if they have not, if they have a UN that's passed and they've not submitted their annual accounts yet, but they want one of these loans, might be a good idea to get that done sooner rather than later. Right. It, um, if, if that's going to be relied upon, we just are not sure at the moment what that is, but I would expect that that would be what it might be when it, when it gets announced. Got it. Okay. And so these loans, they're going to be, you know, as you, as you've been saying, if you're not in a position, if you weren't in a position before, you shouldn't really be considering this type of loan. Yeah. And obviously the banks are going to do their usual kind of credit checks on you to see if you're they are for the um, coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. They, they, we are being told they will not for the um, bounce back loans. And they, because the bounce back loans are 100% underwritten by government, they have pulled out of the consumer credit agreement for those loans. So we are being told that they won't be doing directors or company kind of affordability checks and that kind of stuff on the um, bounce back loans. But that's, again, difficult to know what they might do behind closed doors. <laughs> right. OK. OK. That's, 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 that's really, really fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. Very useful uh, information there. Um, what would you suggest for businesses and practices to be, you know, the best ways to be preparing to come out of lockdown and to be sort of thinking long-term view about their business, particularly if you've found yourself, you've lost a load. I mean, I know a lot of architects, I mean, it really depends at the moment. I'm speaking to lots of architects who are who have been, I don't think construction, can usually construction has hit bad in a yeah. recession. And maybe this is going to something we're going to experience towards the tail end of the year. But right now, a lot of particularly architects offices have been able to move online yeah. and to continue most bits of work. Maybe a lot of site work has stopped. Maybe lots of new inquiries have stopped coming in, but certainly mm -hmm. continuing. What would be your advice for businesses to kind of 
be preparing for their the exit out of lockdown? What would be wise financial strategic planning? Um, I always recommend that people update their cash flows and those kinds of things. So really understanding what your costs are, what your cost base is, and what you need to do on a monthly basis to support that cost base. Um, I often say to people to assess what I call the money leaks in their business to make sure that there is no money leaking out to make sure that they really understand every single expense that's happening where it's going and why is it necessary to keep the proverbial lights on is it delivering you a positive return what is every bit of spending doing so that you are really clear on what you need to be generating in revenue on a monthly basis and then it's about looking at the revenue plan for it so what you know what might that look like are there are there quotes that you had out there that you can pick up again incidentally if there are these people you would hopefully have been communicating with at this point in time as well to try and make sure that you understand the status as it's going along and even just checking in from a you know how are you doing? This is a crazy time we're living in mm. perspective as well can be really good too. So making sure that you understand, you know, what jobs you have to potentially come back to, which ones may or may not exist after this time period. Um, it's going to be very difficult to know how many new jobs are going to come in. That's going to be very hard to predict. Um, and, you know, you might have some feel of that within the industry as to what people are saying. You might get a feel of it from the number of inquiries you had before versus how many are still um, live. You know, you might be able to get a sense of that. And if you can, then trying to predict that going forward to understand what the cash is going to look like in your business. And incidentally, if you are considering a loan, you should be doing this exercise anyway, yeah. so that you can understand that you have the cash available for repayments. What, 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 are, what are kind of classic money leaks that businesses are often unaware mm -hmm. of? So um, great ones are often uh, bits of software. So people have signed up for a trial, they've not canceled it, they've now got three social media scheduling tools, none of which they are using. You know, those types of things can be really, really normal to find or two lots of project management software and they've got two clients on this one, but they've got 372 on this other one. And so, you know, it's, those types of things we do see quite a lot. So being really aware of the software side of things, also little things like, you know, are you on the right energy tariffs for your office? Are mm. you on the right insurances for your vehicles? You know, for example, if you have anybody um, who is who has a company car at the moment, then you can post back the keys to the employer and you can reduce your tax for this year. You can reduce your benefit and kind tax because you don't have the car available for private use. So there's little things like that, that, that people can be looking at to go, okay, yeah, they might only save 10 pounds here and 10 pounds there, but if you have 20 of them, the amounts start to add up on a monthly basis. So just being really, really aware. Um, like I say, I like to assess costs under the headings of, is it 100% necessary to keep the lights on? My business couldn't operate without it. In which yeah. case, of course, of course you need to keep those costs. Um, are they delivering you a positive return in terms of money? Well, if they are, great. Of course you keep that cost. Any other costs tend to be nice to have. And yes, at certain points in time, when the business is doing well financially, nice to haves can be completely fine. But if the finances are under a lot tighter strain, perhaps nice to haves are not the best place to be putting the cash. Yeah. Um, it, it's always interesting when I'm talking to businesses about about recessions and that this this you know this, this recession has happened periodically like this part it's part of the cycle of uh, obviously this, mm -hmm. this is a this is a very unique 
scenario mm-hmm. because it's kind of impacted the whole world pretty much all at the same time and yeah. and the government and the, the economy rather has come to a kind of screeching halt without any yeah. <laughs> without any yeah. warning. not much yeah not much forewarning although we were due a recession but we didn't quite expect to slam into one in the way that we yes have. yeah and it's kind of happened what would you what are the benefits of a recession for a business mm, great question um money is made during a recession Mm. often um you know we do hear that so you know there are opportunities potentially to buy other businesses during recessions there are opportunities to Mm. um lead the way in terms of things like your communications and to stand out from other businesses who are in a panic mode and are pulling back from those things many businesses during a recession will pull back on customer service, we'll pull back on marketing, we'll pull back on content production because these are things that cost money and they can't immediately see a financial value to them. Mm. However, these are things that do have a financial value and therefore they are, and they are also things that that people value a lot. Um, therefore, you know, if you can be ahead with those types of things, actually, you're going to position yourself quite nicely um, going into a recession as well. So making sure that, you know, your communication is high, whoever that is you're speaking to, whether that's clients, whether that's prospects, whether that's leads, mm. whether that's just your online audience, whatever that looks like. Um, I think that places people well for coming out of this. It, it, it's also interesting what you said there as well, that there's lots of like assets that will be going cheaper than usual or certain things that are able to, you know, and that, I suppose that applies to staff as well, that there's, you know, there's going to be people on the job market who are incredibly talented with huge experience who are now going to become available. And if you're in a position to be able to hire those types of people, then fantastic. You know, that's, that's one thing that kind of comes out of this. And also, um, just in terms of preparing for recessions, I mean, I know some of the wealthiest people I've met uh, tend to understand they've survived a number of recessions after they've gone through one. They're like, never let that happen again. And it, it becomes a change in mindset of, I know really we need to be able to have reserves in a business. What, what would you recommend for a business to have in terms of that kind of financial buffer? What does a financial buffer look like? How do you develop one? Yeah. So I, the way you develop one is you squirrel away small amounts every single week so that you have a reserve building up. So what I recommend people to do is they open a separate bank account, a separate business savings account. And then on a weekly basis, they look at how much cash has come into the business. They take a small percentage and they squirrel that away. Um, that can be, that can be 1%. It can be 10%. Great. If it's not, it can be 1%. It can be half a percent, but just starting to get into that habit of building up that buffer. I recommend that businesses have at least two months, if not three months of um, expenses sitting in a buffer so that should things happen, you have some funds there. Um, it's, it's a great habit to get into. And once you've built up that buffer, you can then start doing similar things for other spending. So you can then start, you know, you can then squirrel away money for equipment or you can squirrel away money for, you know, hiring if you want to do a big hiring binge, whatever that might be, but you can actually have separate bank accounts in your business for other things other than just tax and VAT, which many people have. Mm. You can have them for other things too, where you're squirreling away funds on a weekly or monthly basis to enable you to be in a stronger position. And people can even do this now. If they do have even small amounts of revenue coming into their business, even taking half a percent even point one of a percent and just getting that habit of actually have getting to a place where you have a buffer you know what we hear a lot of people speak about in their personal finances having that emergency fund should the boiler break those kinds of things and that's just doing the same for your business and it's a really good idea from you know a financial health point of view and i know that many business owners i've been hearing have been saying if only I had had that already in my business yeah. before we went into this. So it's a very, very good idea just to squirrel away um, money so that you have that emergency yeah. fund there. That, and that, I think that's that's a, a kind of a mindset shift as well. Also in terms of like um, focusing your own personal finance into acquiring assets and particularly cash flowing assets and actually focusing on this on the idea of building wealth, not just kind of live from paycheck to paycheck or live from, and I've, I, I mean, I've, I've met 
entrepreneurs who I've just been amazed at how wealthy they are and how simple their lifestyle actually is. Yes. And now times like this, they're like, you know, I'm going to take a few months off because I can, and it's going to have zero yeah. impact on my, my lifestyle. Um, and yeah, it's a kind of focusing and uh, as you say, kind of squirreling away and having the long-term perspective. Yeah, exactly. And it can be very difficult if you're, you know, in the weeds at the moment and you feel like you're living hand to mouth with your business, mm. both within your business and out with your business, it can be very difficult to say, well, how on earth can I squirrel something away? Because I just, I, I just don't have that. And that's where assessing the costs comes in. That's where making sure that you're really, really clear on what every cost in your business is, is doing for you. Yeah. Um, and potentially the same in your personal life to understand the balance between those and understand what you can and can't do. Fantastic. Annette, that's, that's been absolutely amazing. Is there anything else that we should know? Um, anything else that's kind of... That I don't think so. Great. Okay. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I've covered, uh, I think I've covered everything. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, Annette, thank you so much for that whirlwind of like brilliant uh, expertise that you just shared with us. I feel very great, really grateful for that. You've, that you've come on and contributed like that. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, I hope this is the, you know, I hope there's, there's, we can have some more conversations in the future. Um, definitely me too. Me too. And I'll see you on TikTok in the future. I'll see you hopefully, on t- hopefully all your <laughs> listeners too. Exactly. Get on, get onto TikTok everybody and, uh, go follow, follow Annette and, um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, check out all the fantastic content she's been producing. Annette, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all your listeners too. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.